Today I want to continue sharing on this particular topic that we have started a few weeks ago about a life in the Holy Spirit. But specifically I want to talk about today something very, very important. And the topic is titled, The Signs. Signs of walking in the Holy Spirit. How do I know that we are a Spirit-filled church? Or we are a Spirit-filled family? Or we are a Spirit-filled person? What are some of the signs? How do I know? Now most of us, we take it for granted almost that because we're born again, because we speak in tongues, therefore... I must be a spiritual person. Now, for many people that look at the baptism in the Holy Spirit as a one-time experience, they think of it, oh yes, on that day, at that time, at that moment, in that place, I had an infilling experience and I began to speak in new tongues. But what happens is that subsequent to that, many people fail to understand that the Christian life on an everyday basis is a spirit-filled Life, hallelujah. Every child of God, our greatest joys and moments are when we know in our spirit we are being led by the Holy Spirit, that we are being filled by the Holy Spirit, that God is speaking to us. He's engaged in the deepest things of your life and my life. Isn't that exciting that Father wants to be engaged with us? And last week we saw this particular aspect, one of the signs we started off with of a spirit-filled life. We saw one of the signs was that in Galatians 5.16, if I walk in the spirit, then I will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. How do I know that I'm a spiritual person? That now by my walking in the spirit, I am going against the works of the flesh. And I'm saying I no longer want to walk according to the former manner of life that I used to live. But now I want to walk in the Spirit. I want to talk in the Spirit. I want to live in the Spirit. I want to be filled by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So that will be a life free from from bondage. It will be a life full of deliverance. It will be a life of victory. It will be a life of joy. It will be a life of walking with God in such a powerful way. I want to take it from there. What else are the signs of being filled with the Holy Spirit? Uh, The second sign that I want to bring to our notice, that how do I know I'm living every day a spirit-filled life? Not the sign of baptism in the Holy Spirit, but how do I know that that my life is a spirit-filled life? How do I know that I'm living the fullness of what God has actually, you know, planned for my life? And the Bible says, I want you to look at this, Ephesians and chapter 5, verse 18 and verse 19. Ephesians in chapter 5, verse 18 and verse 19 and the bible goes like this and do not get drunk with wine in which there is debauchery do not be drunk with wine in which there is debauchery but be filled with the spirit then it goes on to say look at this speaking to one another in psalms in hymns and spiritual songs And making melody with your hearts to the Lord. You see, for those of you who have had this experience, you will understand what it means that you wake up one day and you're walking down the street and, and you met with a fellow brother, a fellow sister. And in your heart, you're so full with the Holy Spirit. With the fact that that morning you worshiped God, you walked with God, you spoke to God, you read the word of God. You become so full with the Holy Spirit that when you met a fellow believer, oh, you began to sing a song together. Hallelujah. You're being so filled with the Holy Spirit that, that the, the world cannot hold you back from worshiping God. Amen. Such an exciting life of being filled with the Holy Spirit. There were times, you know, uh, we, I would, when I was uh, in college and leading a fellowship there, I would tell people, why don't you write down a scripture you're memorizing every day? Write it down, put it on a paper and leave it in your pocket. And when we would all see each other, we would pull, pull up each other and ask, what's the scripture you studied today? And so they would, you know, you know, they would say their scripture. Some of them would forget it and they would pick it up and they'd read it again and then memorize it. Some of us would just stand there sometimes and just, just drive, or maybe driving down the road, there are times in our life we just begin to sing a song and someone next to us heard us sing and they joined us singing and then our children heard us sing and they joined us singing and we all just worship God together without any specific reason. 
That is making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Today we have gathered together and week after week, yes, we are making melody in our hearts unto the Lord. That is our corporate worship. But what if, just what if, that we were so filled with the Spirit, we did not need an organized corporate worship to meet each other and we begin to sing a song unto God. Hallelujah. How exciting that would be. Anyone that is filled with the Holy Spirit does not need an organized service to worship God. You'd be walking down the road, you'd be worshiping God. Those, uh, you know, once we were having a watch night service years ago in our church, and we were, uh, you know, we, it was around uh, 10 o'clock in the night that the, it was the year ending service, 10 o'clock in the night. But by 9.30, people had already started coming in. The hall was getting filled. And uh, I was, uh, you know, seated. Some of the leaders, we were in the front row. And I, the worship leader was sitting next to me. Someone else was there. And it was around 9.50. It was not yet 10 o'clock. The service hadn't started. You know, it, it wasn't highly organized as we have, you know, nowadays, you know, to the, to the beat. Uh, and uh, the, the worship leader was just getting ready to go up to the front uh, to lead worship. Hey, there was another 10 more minutes. We were all sitting there and we just started praying in the spirit. While we started praying in the spirit, you know, and, and everybody's just waiting, just waiting for the service to start. And suddenly in my heart, a song came and I began to hum the song. I began to hum the song gently and I began to slowly sing the song very gently. Someone sitting next to me heard me sing and joined with the song. And this person sang along, and then someone else. When the worship leader saw her, that someone had started the song already, quickly got into the scale, picked up the scale, and started playing the guitar. And before we knew, 9.53, the church just went into a spontaneous time of worship, singing and making a melody unto God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! What an exciting thing it would be for us to worship God. That we can, what would that mean? That would be a sign of a spirit-filled church. We don't need a reason to worship God. We don't need the beat or the sound or the music. We would worship God with this and we would worship God without this. Hallelujah. Because we are making melody in our heart. The Bible says, do not be drunk with wine. Which means don't get obsessed by other things that exhilarate you. Don't get caught up in a life of other things that exhilarate you, get you excited. Do not be drunk with wine in which there is debauchery, there is sin, there is, you know, all kinds of wickedness, there's all kinds of disobedience that comes in that. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Speaking to one another. Well, sometimes you just go see somebody. You'll be walking down with a friend or you'll be walking down with your spouse and you will be speaking to one another about the scriptures. You'll be speaking to one another about... The, you know, sometimes myself and Pastor Hannah, we'll just be, we'll just be sitting there and, and suddenly I'll think, you know what, this scripture, you know, I'm just amazed about the scripture. And she'll share her thoughts. She'll say, uh, you know, I would say, wow, you know, that's exciting. And I'll say, these are some of the things that I'm seeing. And, you know, there are times we'll just be in our room and we'll get excited about the scripture. We'll get excited about God. We'll get excited about revival. And we're not in an organized meeting. There's nobody spurring us to say hallelujah. There's nobody telling us, why don't we lift our hands now and praise the Lord. There's nobody asking us to pray in the spirit. But what happens when you live a spirit-filled life, one of the signs is that you will speak to one another. You will sing to one another. You will sing hymns and psalms and spiritual songs. And you will make a melody in your heart unto God. When was the last time? As a family, you made a melody unto the Lord. When was the last time as a church, not because this was an organized service, but as a church when we got together, just standing on a street corner, you're getting excited about God. That you just forgot how time went by because you stood there and spoke about the goodness of God. Spoke about the plans of God for us as a community. Spoke about the intents of God upon the lives of people. We begin to pray in tongues. We begin to stand together. Pray, you know, stand together. Speaking to one another. Singing to one another. And in everything, giving thanks. In everything, whatever our circumstance. When you and I live a spirit-filled life, praise becomes natural to the spirit-filled Christian. Hallelujah. 
Praise becomes just natural. It's an everyday thing. You don't need a good incident to happen to your life to praise him. You praise him because he is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Amen. Lift your voice and praise him. Hallelujah. He can be worshipped. He is worthy of our worship. We don't need an incident. We don't need a good thing God has done for us. Some people say, I praise God because he's a good God. No, I praise him because he is God. Hallelujah. We don't need a good incident in our life to praise him. Some of the greatest praise came from Paul and Silas in prison. Some of the greatest praise came from Daniel and his friends when they were, you know, in a lion's den or thrown into the fire. They said, oh king, even if God does not deliver us, we will still praise him. That is a spirit-filled life. Hallelujah. God wants us to live. Are you a spirit-filled Christian? Are you living every day a spirit-filled life? If not God's calling, tugging on your heart today, the Lord is saying, I want you to live a spirit-filled life. The Bible says in John's gospel in chapter 4, you know the story of the Samaritan, the woman of Samaria. Jesus walks up to her and says, can I have a drink? And, and she says, you know, the whole conversation that goes on. She was a wicked woman that the Jew wouldn't touch with a six foot pole. The people didn't want to have anything to do with her. And yet, when it came to a revelation of worship, Jesus chose this downtrodden, rejected, non-Jew non-man, woman, I mean, he picked someone like that and said, I want to tell you a secret. He says, days are coming, you're neither going to worship on Mount Gerashim, which was the place of worship of the Samaritan people, Mount Gerashim. Neither are we going to worship on this mountain, which you say your father Jacob has given, nor are we going to worship in Jerusalem, which we Jews say that our father has given. Jesus was making a proclamation. If you think that church is cool or this church is cool or that place is cool or oh, I wish I could go to that place and there'd be revival. No, there'd be revival if you would get on your knees, there would be revival. You can go to some of the biggest places of revival and miss it. Because the heart posture is not one of desiring to be a spirit-filled Christian. God wants us as children of God to be spirit-filled Christian. And so, you know, Jesus looks at this woman. Days are coming neither in Gershom nor in Jerusalem. But the true worshipers of God, and Jesus said, are going to worship in the spirit. Which means a spirit-filled worship, a spirit-filled life is so paramount to a normal Christian life. You take the spiritual life out of Christian life, it goes back to almost where they were in Judaism. Just thinking about the scripture, just discussing and debating, some theology here, some theology there. And it goes back into a life without the Holy Spirit. That is why even as you grow older, as you know the Lord, as the years go by, don't pull back on that life in the Spirit. What you began in the Spirit, don't try to finish it or stop it in the flesh. What you started in the walk with the Holy Spirit, the day you got filled with God, the day you got but anointed with the Spirit of God. The day you started walking with the Holy Spirit, what you started there, don't stop with something less. Jesus looked at her and said, days are coming that true worshipers will worship in the Spirit. One of the signs of a Spirit-filled Christian is Spirit-filled worship. It's a spirit-filled worship, and I don't mean just where we come, a charismatic kind of worship. I mean a spirit-filled worship by which I mean where we are so filled with the spirit every day that worship is what manifests itself. Hallelujah. That you can be standing in your kitchen while you're cooking your meal, and you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can be in your office when you're having a bad day, and you can just bow your head and be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can just be having a difficult time in your marriage and not knowing how to go from there. But you can just look to the Lord and be filled in the Spirit. You can sing a song. You can, you know, sometimes you, you're going through a difficult time in your marriage. Both of you get together. You know, speak to one another in hymns, in psalms, in spiritual songs. Make a melody unto God. And the things that seem so difficult will not be so hard anymore. Hallelujah. Be filled in the Spirit. One of the signs is that you would worship in the Spirit. Another sign of being filled with the Spirit is that we would be led by the Holy Spirit. Every Christian has a unique privilege 
And I want to use the word privilege. We have a unique privilege from the Father that the Father wants to speak to every one of us as his children. That he wants to speak to our heart and he wants to guide us. He wants to tell us where to go. Romans in chapter 8, verse 13 and verse 14. Romans in chapter 8, verse 13 and verse 14. The Bible says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Verse 14 says, for those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. Somehow Jesus attached a leading of the spirit as the, as the normal life of a child of God. That if you and I say I'm a child of God, there has to be a spirit-led life. A spirit -led, listen to me, a spirit-led life does not mean that the moment you pray in the spirit, he will tell you to go to Timbuktu as a missionary. A spirit-led life, you don't have to fear that if the moment you pray in the spirit, he will ask you to give a million dollars to the Lord's work. No, a spirit-led life is that every day you're so filled with the spirit, you want to tell others about this wonderful God who's transformed your life. That's a spirit for life. That you're conscious every day. You're conscious of God with us. That God is with us. God is in us. God is for us. God is walking with us. You know, as little children, God can speak to you every day. You can have a spirit-filled life every day. And that should be the inheritance. It should be the daily desire of a child of God for those who are led by the Spirit. They are the children of God. Those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. As Christians, we should learn to be led by the Holy Spirit every day. I was sharing a story in the morning service. I said many years ago, I was invited to speak in a foreign nation. And when I was invited to speak over there, uh, they, you know, they would send, they, they offered to buy the air ticket, take me there and get the visa and whatever to speak at a conference. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me saying, take one of our colleagues along, one of my colleagues along for the ministry. And so I wrote to those friends asking them, uh, is it okay? Can you, can, uh, you know, I just feel I need to bring one of our, my colleagues along with us to the Lord's work. Can you please uh, send, uh, uh, you know, the, an air ticket and a visa? So they wrote back to me saying, Dr. John, uh, sorry, we cannot send you the air ticket and visa because we don't have money for it. And we have money only for one speaker. And I'm thinking in my heart by now, I'm furious. I'm saying, these fellows go abroad, make money. They don't have money to send for one more speaker. This is for the Lord's work. I was so upset. So I went back to God and I told the Lord, Lord, look at these fellows living abroad. They don't have money for one more air ticket. And the Lord asked me, who asked you to ask them? I said, what do you mean, Lord? The Lord said, you buy the air ticket and take him. And I'm talking about, this is the year 2000. In the year 2000. That's 22 years ago. And the cost of one air ticket to get my friend along to go with me in those days, in 22 years ago, was 25,000 rupees. And our one month's expense in those days, living where we used to live in the north, was 2,000 rupees. So the cost of one air ticket is one year's expense. And I said, Lord, you want me to take him? I think I can preach alone. It's, I'm pretty good. This is... This is okay. The conference is good. You know, we can handle this. But the Lord told me, take him along. So I said, okay, Lord. I said, but I don't have the money. I don't have 25,000. So we began to pray. We began to pray and supernaturally somebody sent me 25,000 rupees. We went ahead and bought his air ticket and we were ready now to go to that other nation and preach. By now I'm feeling like a rich man. I'm like, you don't, we don't need your money to take a preachers, you know, to the countries. God's going to send us to the nations. You know, I was all so pumped up by the way God had provided. But now here was the problem. We did not have 2,000 rupees to leave with my colleague's wife and child because they're going to be left alone in North India. So we needed 2,000 rupees for that month's expense. So I asked him, what's the month's expense? He says, 2,000 rupees. I said, so we took a piece of paper, we wrote it down on the piece of paper, 2,000. And we put our hands on it and we prayed, Father, send Elijah's scrolls, Lord, with the money. In Jesus' mighty name, there's 2,000 rupees. Because that's all we knew how to pray. You see, I said, I'm just led by God to take you 
And I'm just led by God and I've seen God's supernatural provision. Let's pray for this. While this is going on, a friend of ours who used to be with us in a fellowship here in this city many years ago had come to, God, come to the northern part of the country, was in a city nearby, had come there to study. Calls me up and says, Dr. John, uh, can, we, can I come and visit you over the weekend? I said, sure, come along. So we were thinking, poor fellow must be hungry. We'll make some biryani for him. You know, with what little, little we had, we just were used to just, you know, having a good time trusting God. This person came. He came and uh, he, he came to us and he said, actually, the Lord has asked me to, uh, you know, for, come for a specific reason. We spent the weekend together. We worshiped together. We prayed together. We shared the scriptures. We poured into his life. Lovely brother. And uh, the Lord spoke to me saying, buy him his train ticket back to Delhi from where we were. So I said, okay. So I went to the station and I bought him his train, uh, train ticket. And I remember, I think it was around 215 rupees. So I bought him the train ticket now to go back to Delhi. And I have to obey God with every guidance. And why? Because those that are led by the Spirit are the children of God. Children of God listen to Daddy's voice. So I went ahead and bought him the train ticket. And his train ticket was that Sunday night at 10 o'clock. Uh, you know, Dadar Amritsar Express going to Delhi via our city. And before going... He comes to me and he says, actually, the reason I came, I said, what was the reason? He said, the Lord asked me to bring you guys an offering. I looked at him and I said, is the offering 2,000 rupees? He said, yes, it is. I looked at my colleague and I said, our crow has come. (laughs) Yeah. I said, praise God. That's wonderful. I'm so excited. And he said, what? I said, is this your month's expense? He said, yeah, this is what my dad sent me to make it through the month. The Lord spoke to me and said, take out your wallet and give him your wallet. I said, you want me to give him a wallet? I took out the wallet. I'm thinking I already bought him the, the train ticket. You see, see, this is the problem with being honest, you know, with the dealings of your heart. So I looked in, I think there was some 200 and something rupees, if I remember correctly, in the wallet. And the Lord told me, give it to him. So I said, thank you for the 2,000. I gave it there. I said, the Lord's asked me to bless you with this. He said, no, 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 no. I said, better receive, because he was a friend. I said, you better receive it. You'll need it for the month. Anyway, he received the 200 something, got on the train, he went back. Months later when I met him, I said, did the 200 come to any use? He looked at me and said, of course, I made it through the month with that. You know, somehow I scraped through the month. It's so important for us to be listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Where we go, what we do, what we start, how we live. You know, we need to train our children to listen to the voice of God. Why? Because the children of God listen to the voice of the Father. We must be living a spirit-filled life. A spirit-filled life does not always mean, when God guides us, does not always mean he will guide us into green pastures. Of course, every one of you knows Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me in green pastures. You know, but we forget the other scriptures, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. He doesn't lead us only into green pastures. Hello, Psalm 23. He leads us into the valley of the shadow of death. But I will fear no evil because God is. Hallelujah. That's the confidence of a child of God. God is. Come on, let me hear you. God is. He's, God is with me. That's the confidence of the child of God that we will be led by the Holy Spirit. That we will walk in the Spirit, we'll be led by God. One day, you know, uh, the Philip the evangelist was preaching in Samaria and soon after a great revival in Samaria, Acts said he's whisked off by Trinity Travels. Father, Son and Holy Ghost picked him up and took him all the way and dropped him near an Ethiopian eunuch's chariot. And now the, it's amazing, the Lord tells him, I brought you till here, now you catch up with the chariot. This is amazing. Some of us feel that God pick us up and drop us in the chariot. God doesn't do that. He brings us somewhere nearby. And from there, he tells you, now figure it out from here. Hallelujah. Why? Because we're the children of God. He gives you one thing at a time. He doesn't tell you all the details. In fact, I've often thought in my life, if God gave me all the details, I would have run away. (laughs) God usually tells us all the good things that are going to happen, all the blessed things. But I do know the end is always good. Hallelujah. See, eternity is a beautiful place with the Father. Heaven is a wonderful place to be. And so I am confident of this one thing. If you walk in the Spirit, the end is always good. This Ethiopian eunuch, the Bible says in verse 26, But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. 
There's a desert road. So he got up and went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all the treasury. So he is now following the guidance of God. He's experiencing in his exit, he has Trinity travels. In his entry, he has the responding to God's voice. Sometimes we feel every aspect of obedience in our life has to be supernatural. Fire and stone and smoke and all of that. No, on his way there, he just had to obey the voice of God. In his way away, God would whisk him away. Look what happens. An angel of the Lord speaks to him. An angel of the Lord speaks to him, says, get up, get going. But look at verse 29. Then the Spirit said to Philip, the Holy Spirit is now speaking to Philip, go up and join this chariot, which means run along, go and catch up with the chariot. Now you're on your foot, the chariot is, you know, going, you go up and catch up with this chariot and run along and he joined the chariot. Philip ran up, heard him, read Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I understand if someone doesn't explain? The Holy Spirit set up. A spirit-led encounter in his life. There are so many times in your life. If you will live every day a spirit-filled life, God can send you to your neighbor to tell them about the love of Jesus. God can take you to someone in the church to lay hands on the sick that they can, be, they can recover or they can have supernatural healing. God can send you to a relative back in your native place who does not know the love of Jesus and they can get born again because you are living a spirit-filled life. Hallelujah. When you live a spirit-filled life, there's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of excitement about obedience And it's not easy all the time, but when you obey the Lord, when you walk with God, when you get filled with the Spirit, there's an excitement about living that kind of a life. Another sign of living a Spirit-filled life, another sign of living a Spirit-filled life is that we would, the Bible says in Acts and chapter 1, verse 5 and verse 8, what are the signs? How do I know I'm Spirit-filled? How do I know that, I'm, not that I'm just baptized in the Spirit, or I just received the Holy Ghost, or I had a Spirit-filled experience. How do I know I'm living a Spirit-filled life? If I spend time with God, then God's burdens become my burden. Amen. You know that famous saying by Bill Bright, the, 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 the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. He said, Lord, break my heart with the things that break yours. What a powerful prayer. If that doesn't drive us to do something for God, I don't know what will. And I'm sure that was birthed out of a time of a a, a moment where he's calling on God and saying, Lord, break my heart with the things that break yours. Acts chapter 1 verse 5 says like this, For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 8 says, But you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. One of the signs of a spirit filled life is that you and I, we will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us and you will be a witness for Jesus. How do I know I'm a spirit filled Christian? How do I know I'm living a spirit filled Christian life? Witness. That's taking responsibility. Telling somebody about Jesus. Telling somebody about the love of God. Yesterday I was talking to one doctor. We met, we were talking about some health things. We were talking about hormones and all the different parameters and all of that. And some people, uh, you know, we were talking about getting healthy. And some people heard that and they, and they were saying, well, that, that's like evangelism. You know, you, know, you know, talking about getting to good health. That's true. That's true. If you're passionate about something or somebody, you will talk about it. And if we are passionately living a spirit-filled life, we will speak about the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Everywhere we go, everywhere we go, we will have the power to witness. Uh, You know, some of you heard the story. I was traveling to another country one day. I was, as I was traveling on the plane, I was going through a very difficult time. And there were a whole bunch of air hostesses that were traveling. They were not serving on the plane. They were just moving between locations. And this one air hostess sitting next to me, she saw me reading the Bible and singing and praying. She looked at me and she said, "Uh, are you praying? And this was a very, very, very low moment of my life. I was going through such pain because of, uh, you know, someone had, you know, lived a disobedient life, had broken my heart, and I was just praying for the person. I was so heartbroken. And this air hostess turned to me, are you praying? And I just knew in my heart, that's my, that's my key. That's my open door. So on one side, 
I want to tell them, can you leave me alone? I'm crying. But on the other side, I told myself, this is my moment. And I turned around, I said, yes. And I said, have you heard about Jesus? And I shared the gospel with that air hostess. And I started prophesying over her. She heard the prophecy, she was shocked. She listened to the gospel and I prayed for her. She gets up from there, goes to the back. And then after some time, she comes back. She says, if you don't mind, there are others in the back that like you to share what Jesus has to say for them. 35,000 feet in the air, you can live a spirit-filled life. Hallelujah. You can live a spirit-filled life on an everyday basis. I could tell you stories. I was just telling uh, someone just now. I was saying most of my stories you hear again and again are from younger years. And the reason you'll hear it again and again from our younger years, because in our younger years, there was an emotion burnt with the goodness of God. There was always a tear that ran down. said, oh God, wow, you did that. Oh, it's amazing. And any time an emotion is burnt in with an event, you remember it. As the years have gone by, I just know God's a good God. He's going to do it. He's going to sort it out. And uh, there are so many things that are happening on an everyday basis. Hallelujah. Hearing from the Holy Spirit. Living a life of the Holy Spirit. Obeying God. Stepping out. Going and doing things. Because the Spirit of God is asking us to do that. And when we do that, we will see that the, the work of God begins to grow as a result of being led by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Every one of us can live a, a, live a life that has a power to witness and we will operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. One of the signs of a spiritual life is that we will share about Jesus, the power to witness. We will lay hands on the sick. They will recover. We will see miracles. Maybe all don't get healed. Some people say, Pastor, all didn't get healed. But I want to thank God for the 10 that did get healed when we prayed. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to thank God for the 20 that saw a deliverance in their life. I I would rather keep praying for people, keep believing God, and keep challenging people to go out and be witnesses for Jesus and live that spirit-filled life. Hallelujah. I want to thank God for that. One more. What is the another sign of a spirit-filled life? I can't finish all the signs today. I will continue in the next sessions. But what is another sign of living a spirit-filled life? Another sign of living spirit-filled life, the Bible says in Jude and verse 20. Jude and verse 20 says like this, But you, beloved, you, you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. One of the signs of a spirit-filled life is that a spirit-filled Christian is used to praying in the Spirit. A spirit-filled Christian longs to pray in the Spirit. A spirit-filled Christian is not worldly wise, but is spirit wise. You heard Pastor Jesus share some time ago, the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. Amen. The foolishness of God. Some of the most foolish things we've done as a spirit-filled Christian. Down the road, they look at you and say, what a man of faith. Oof. What a man of faith. At that time, we'll be going, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> was nothing. Uh, but when we are obeying God, <laughs> are you sure this is you, Lord? Lord, you want me to give how much? You want me to give that much? You know, the, the times we just obey God, the life, spiritual life, when God guides you, leads you. When I was growing up as a young Christian, you know, we learned to pray. I, I went to a conference one day. A man of God taught us. He said, pray in the spirit at all times with all kinds of prayer. We started praying one hour, two hours, three hours, started praying in the Spirit. The Bible says building. What happens when you pray in the Spirit? A Spirit-filled Christian. Walking down. You're standing in the bus stop. You don't know what to do. You got five minutes before the bus came. Pray in the Spirit. In fact, you don't have to shake when you're praying in the Spirit. You can be naturally supernatural. Amen. Amen. You know, when you, when you, what is praying in the Spirit? The Bible says you're speaking mysteries to God, which means secrets are going on. Between you and God. You must be telling God, God, I'm, I'm such a total jerk. Lord, you need to shake me up. That's probably what you're saying in the spirit. And God is saying, Amen. Huh? <laughs> but since we don't know what it is, it's a mystery to God. And, and a mystery unto God. And it's a mystery for us, but not for God. But when we speak mystery, suppose you share a mystery to a secret to your father. Daddy, you're sharing a secret. While you're sharing a secret to your father, do you start shaking? You don't need to shake. To be filled in the spirit. Now, you may shake when the Holy Ghost comes on you. 
Ah, uh, maybe a holy shake. God may be doing that. That's a totally different thing. Signs, wonders, signs, blunders. <laughs> Anything can happen, you know, right? But the point is, walk in the spirit. Our fathers got filled with the spirit. Don't let go of that legacy. Don't, don't let go of the legacy of our generations that have walked with God. And if you come from another background where you don't have such a legacy, begin that legacy. Live a spirit-filled life. Walk in the spirit. Talk in the spirit. Pray in the spirit. You see, when we pray in the spirit, Romans 8.26 says, In the same way the spirit also helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought to pray. But the spirit himself intercedes for us. With groanings too deep for words. Many times I've woken up, say in the middle of the night, and wide awake, don't know what to do. We'll be going, Shanturi Kerebi, Konoso Kerebi, Shene, Oh, Re Kere, Kama Shaman. Just open him out, go ahead, open him out, pray in the Spirit. Ro Sante Keshu Tori Kanamia Sante, Ko Rebe Rebe Shanturo Viana, Zonte Kerebi Hande, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Re Kinama Shandoroke. Manto kere yotoro. Oh, what a joy! We can speak to the Father. Hallelujah! We don't need we don't need a time. We don't need a contact. We are connected right now. You are connected right now as you're praying in the Holy Spirit, building yourself up in the most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! The Bible says they were all filled with the Spirit. Every one of us can live a spirit-filled life. You don't have to be dependent on somebody. The Holy Spirit is there for you. The Spirit of God is in you. The Spirit of God is for you. I remember when I came full-time into the ministry, I used to go at 7.45 in the morning to Medical College Trivandrum to work. I would leave my home at 7.45 in the morning. 8 o'clock, we would, you know, sign in for, for work. But when I came full-time in the ministry, I told myself, if I would go at 7.45 to work for the government here, why shouldn't I not go at 7.45 to work for Heaven's government? And I went to the church office. Nobody would, you know, we didn't have times of prayer. We didn't have organized prayer at that time. And even if the church doesn't have an organized time of prayer, by 8 o'clock in the morning, I went in and I locked up and I started praying. A few weeks went by, I started inviting the people in the church. I said, guys, we're praying between 8 and 10. We're just praying in the spirit. What do we do? We were just praying in the spirit. Just praying in the spirit. And then one by one, I said, people, before you go to work, if you'd like to just join, you want to come 20 minutes, pray and go. They just come and go. People started joining. 1, 2, 10, 15, 20. People, the numbers began to increase. There, nobody was leading that prayer, but everybody came and just prayed. Hallelujah. Everybody just prayed in the spirit. So many people from that group today, so many people are being used by God in the nations of the world right now. Hallelujah. From that small time of prayer that we met together, thousands have turned to the Lord just in the ministries of these few people that gathered for prayer. Hallelujah. I want you to know if you're a child of God, God's calling you to live a spirit filled life. You will pray in the spirit. You will, you know, you will sing songs, melody unto God. You know, you will, you will walk in the spirit. You will be, you will tell others about Jesus Christ. But it is my prayer right now that every one of us will get, begin to live a spirit filled life. Don't live, you know, a, a, a Christian coming to church and speaking in tongues only when you're in church. That's tradition. But a spirit filled Christian doesn't operate in tradition. He operates being led by the Holy Spirit. Everywhere we are is a good time to pray in the Spirit. Amen. Let's all pray together. Open your mouth. Let's just pray in the Spirit for some time. Hallelujah. Don't wait for anybody. There's nobody leading you right now. Go ahead. Those of you that are watching online also. Nobody leading you right now. Be filled with the Holy Spirit right now. Just begin to speak in tongues. That's right. Go ahead. Zotare bikaramiantabashatarabilabakere. Oh, Landa Sana, just so to be out of a city, Ketoro, Venam Yan Telebe Shekere. Oh, just be filled with the Holy Spirit. Miracles will happen where you are right now. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Then your breakthroughs will begin to come. Then take in on Teo Shoro, Biara Bakena Mila Kana, Zo Kero Telobo Sundere Bibela Kene, Re Torio for Sote Kere Bila. Build yourself up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Revival comes inside of you when you pray in the Spirit. Lord, I pray, release your anointing upon the church in a mighty way. Release your anointing upon the church, upon every family, Lord. We want our families to be spirit-filled families, Lord. Ragida baramian tamaseke, ro talianda shatoroke. Lord, we want our young children 
young children lord i pray in jesus name lord fill these young children in the holy spirit of god let them grow up to be children that are led by the spirit of god that are filled by the spirit of god that are anointed by the spirit of god jesus release your anointing in a mighty way release your anointing in a mighty way release your anointing upon these children of god let a generation of spirit filled children rise up in the church lord we worship you kore be shanta kaba hallelujah 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 we praise you praise you praise you jesus hallelujah we worship you jesus we give you glory and honor because you're such a mighty god father i pray even as a church we submit our lives to a spirit filled living we submit our lives to a spirit filled lord even as we listen to the signs we know how so much of our life is not a spirit filled life and starting today god we want to come right back into living a spirit filled life every day walking in the spirit praying in the spirit we just come in our lives and pray a blessing on the church in jesus mighty name amen and amen amen god bless you